Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program of Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Zaid Al Rab from Leeds, United Kingdom. Dr. Zaid is the founder of Orthopass, a website dedicated to FRC South MCQs. He's an orthopedic surgeon based out of Leeds in the United Kingdom. If you have noticed, Dr. Al Rab has delivered a couple of lectures on our channel and it's already reached a huge audience. And today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Zaid Al Rab for this wonderful live program. What would you say? Hi, Hidesh. Uh, thank you again for having me uh, into the, um, uh, your nice uh, program. I will uh, talk about hip arthroplasty and some MCQs uh, that are commonly uh, tested in the exam. Um, some of the topics we will be covering, uh, obviously related to arthroplasty, periprosthetic joint infection, fracture, instability and dislocation, and related basic sciences to hip arthroplasty. We will also be touching a little bit on the avascular necrosis and pagets as a pathology that may lead to arthroplasty and anatomical um, uh, related question. The first question is a 77 year old patient who presents with a painful right total hip replacement that was performed two years ago and has always remained painful since the time of operation. The blood tests and joint aspirates were performed. From the options below, select the minimum criteria for diagnosis of a periprosthetic joint infection in this scenario. So very commonly asked and relies on your knowledge about uh, the international consensus meeting uh, for uh, criteria for diagnosing uh, periprosthetic joint infection. And so you have to be fully uh, familiar with those. The right answer is a synovial white cell count of more than 3000. Uh, per microliter with both elevated CRP and ESR. And if you look at the explanation, it states that the international consensus meeting on surgical site and periprosthetic joint infection stated the approximate cutoffs applying uh, to tests obtained more than six weeks from the most recent surgery. And that's ESR more than 30, CRP more than 10 with synovial white cell count of more than 3,000 per microliter and synovial poly polymorphonuclear percentage of more than 80%. Next question is a 75 year old man who is two years post um, cemented total hip replacement performed for osteoarthritis, sustained a fall and landed on his left side. X-rays are shown below. The acetabulum is well fixed. Taking into account the appearance of the X-ray of the femoral component, what would be the most appropriate classification of injury and treatment option? So in this question, it is directly testing your knowledge of the Vancouver classification and applying the knowledge of the Vancouver classification into managing this kind of injury. And as you can see demonstrated in the X-ray, there is a significant uh, periprosthetic fracture, which probably is classified as a Vancouver B classification. There's also a radiolucent line surrounding the medial aspect of the femoral component, and that indicates that the stem is loose. Therefore, the classification will fall into classification uh, B2, as the bone stock appears to be uh, good. And the options are whether it's uncemented revision and open reduction internal fixation or an open reduction internal fixation with a cement and cement revision. And the answer is number four, which is Vancouver B2, performing an open reduction internal fixation and cement and cement revision. And the explanation here goes through the three different types of Vancouver classification, A, B, and C, and explains why was the uh, other choices are, were incorrect. Bear in mind, there is an element of controversy in this question because both Vancouver B2 answers are correct. Some Will, some surgeons will choose to do uncemented revision with open induction internal fixation. Some surgeons will choose to do cement and cement revision. And while this may stir controversy with regards to which is the most correct answer, you have to keep in mind that a lot of the questions in the real exam will give you this kind of dilemma. 
And the only way to try and um, be able to answer the, the, the question correctly is by knowing more literature and further knowledge on the topic, not necessarily from the book, because the book will state the options most likely, but literature will give more information and more knowledge about the success of each treatment. And therefore you'll have more chance of answering the question correctly by knowing the literature behind the topic. The next question is stating corti decompression following avascular necrosis of the femoral head is more likely to be successful if the patient has not progressed beyond which stage. And the options are stage one to five from the FECAT classification. Now, with regards to core decompression, it's a joint preserving procedure that is usually performed for early stage avascular necrosis. And more, more specifically, it is prior to the presence of the crescent sign on the X-ray, which indicates subchondral collapse at the femoral head. And therefore, the question is asking directly about your knowledge with regards to the uh, stages of the FECAT classification, then how to apply that in terms of being aware of at which stage there is a crescent sign appears and therefore a, a joint preserving procedure becomes uh, less likely to be successful. The answer is number two, and that's FECAT classification number two. And again, bear in mind that the FECAT classification has been modified over the years, and there is a, a, an element of confusion when you look at the early uh, FECAT classification and the one that came, so the early one was in 1964, and then there's another one that came out about 20 years after, and it's been modified a few times. Generally speaking, it's FECAT stage two, indicates maintenance of the contour of the femoral head without subchondral collapse. And therefore, anything beyond stage two, you are less likely to be successful with a core decompression procedure. And here is the stages of the FECAT classification for the candidates to learn in more details about it. Next question, when cementing femoral, a femoral stem, what is thought to be the most likely cause for severe hypertension related to bone cement implantation syndrome? This is a very direct question. It is not, um, there's no tricks and it, 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 all it does is asking you about your knowledge, but the theories suggest, suggested with regards to bone cement implantation syndrome. The correct answer is multiple emboli. Now we know that there has been multiple theories suggested as to the cause of bone cement implantation syndrome. And to start with, it is the definition of bone cement implantation syndrome is hypoxia, hypotension, and uh, loss of consciousness occurring around the time of cementation, prosthesis insertion, reduction of the joint, or occasionally limb tunicate deflation in a patient undergoing cemented bone surgery. The current thinking on the etiology is now leaning more towards multiple emboli, which is, could be fat, bone marrow, cement particles, air and bone particles, as well as a uh, platelet and fibrin aggregates. The previous theory was that methyl methacrylate monomers entering the circulation and causing vasodilation is the lead uh, uh, reason for severe hypertension, but that has now been disputed. A 78-year-old patient presents to any department with total hip replacement dislocation four months post index procedure. In absence of infection, select the factor that is most likely to contribute to the risk of dislocation. This question is a very simple example on uh, hip instability and asking about the risk factors that contribute to that and being aware of, uh, of them. With regards to uh, uh, the options, uh, I think it, this is a fairly straightforward question and the, his, the medical history of Parkinson's disease is the culprit in this case, as we know that any neurological uh, illnesses 
can lead to abnormal contractures or abnormal muscle tone, and therefore um, more likely uh, uh, abnormal positioning uh, and contractures, therefore leading to dislocation. Now, with regards to the other options, we know that the astabular component inclination of 40 degrees um, is, uh, is actually what we aim for normally. Um, and that's based on the uh, safe zone of uh, Lennox, um, which is frequently coated. Um, we know that the uh, acetabular uh, component diameter on the outer side actually has no effect on dislocation rate. However, the head size to the inner diameter of the cup does have a direct effect through the uh, uh, the jumping distance um, that affects the dislocation. With regards to the approach, we know that the direct lateral approach uh, or what we normally call the hardened approach has lower um, history, uh, historically has lower uh, dislocation rate in comparison to other approaches like the posterior approach, which is uh, often and commonly performed. In planning of a total hip replacement for a patient with Paget's disease, which of the following is not an expected finding? Acetabular protrusion, higher than usual blood loss, harder than usual bone, valgus deformity of the neck, and high cardiac output. So again, this is an, a, a kind of a, a combination of pathology and performing a hip replacement in pathological bone. This is not only important in the multiple choice questions, but it's also important to know for the part two examination, the VIVA exam, because this is a very common, uh, commonly tested concept with regards to your knowledge about the challenges involved in performing total replacement on a patient with Paget disease. They commonly do have a stabular protrusion. They will have higher than usual blood loss due to um, a high cardiac output. And obviously we do know that they do also have some heart failure. So that's in your preparation and planning. This is something that you may need to address prior to make sure the patient is medically optimized. And they do have harder than usual bones. So therefore your reaming uh, of the acetabulum and the femur can be more difficult. The correct answer for this question is answer number four. And that is valgus deformity of the femoral neck. And due to the bone remodeling of the bone and high vascularity, um, we typically see varus deformity uh, as we do have, as you understand, the Paget disease go through phases of osteoporotic phases and osteoblastic. And the initial osteoporotic changes can lead to deformity under loading and under compression. And therefore the bone remodels into a final shape of a varus deformity. An 80-year-old patient complains of growing pain of 18 months duration following a total hip replacement. Physical examination reveals pain reproduced with resisted hip flexion. The blood workup for infection is within normal. Radiographs are normal apart from retroverted cup. The most appropriate next step management is a triphasic bone scan, steroid injection into iliopsoas bursa, MRI with metal artifact reduction, aspiration of a hip joint, proceeding to acetabular component revision. So here, the key is in the physical examination finding, which is showing a re a resisted hip flexion pain, as well as obviously the x-ray finding of a retroverted cup. This is all indicating and hinting towards an iliosaurus impingement syndrome following a total replacement, which can happen in about 4% of patients. Therefore, a steroid injection to iliosaurus bursa, which is normally is ultrasound guided, uh, would be the most appropriate step in management, considering the fact that the blood workup for infection was normal, and there is no suggestion to say that there has been any unusual history from the stem of the question to suggest that pre, you know, a potential late infection uh, blood-borne or 
um, seeding infection into the joint has been the case. Uh, therefore, I think that takes us away from loosening from periprosthetic joint infection, which would have been um, then uh, moving the candidates towards choosing aspiration of the hip joint or requiring a triphasic bone scan to look for loosening. Uh, an MRI with metal artifact um, is, again, an option in terms of investigation, but usually is, is something that we tend to look for in patients who have metal or metal uh, prosthesis to look for a pseudo collection and pseudo tumor. Um, and therefore, the most like the most correct answer would be in this case would be steroid injection into the iliopsoas versa. And the question, the explanation tends to explain that the cause of the iliopsoas uh, bursitis could be through extrusion of cement or by prominent acetabular component uh, due to retroversion of the cup. Injury to which artery is most likely to cause uncontrollable bleeding during posterior approach to the hip? Very direct question with regards to uh, the anatomical structures at risk. And in this case, the correct answer is the inferior gluteal artery, which is a branch of the anterior division of the internal iliac artery. The reason why this may cause uncontrollable bleeding is that the inferior gluteal artery has tendency to retract into the pelvis requiring the patient to be turned to supine position and requiring urgent laparotomy to tie off the internal iliac artery. It then goes on to explain the, uh, the origin of the uh, artery in the pelvis and what structures supplied by the artery in the gluteal region and the thigh. The recommended follow-up for a patient to underwent the procedure shown in the radiograph is, so, the X-ray does show a what appears to be a right hip resurfacing procedure. Most likely in the UK, it would be a Birmingham resurfacing. And to be able to answer the question, you have to be aware of the guidelines by the MHRA and the British Hip Society guidelines with regards to follow up for patients with metal on metal prosthesis. The correct answer is answer number four, and that's follow up in the first at first year, then once at year seven, and three yearly after that. So year 10, year 13, 16, unless there is a complication. The explanation here explains that a ODEP 10A or 10A star rated hip resurfacing devices are the mat or so adept resurfacing head as well as the Smith and Nephew Birmingham resurfacing head size from 48 to 62. Now, patients at risk of adverse reaction to metal debris or ARMD, commonly known, are female patients, male patients with femoral components smaller than 48, and patients with DIPWI ASR implant, an implant that has been retracted out of the market. Now, those patients at risk should be reviewed annually for as long as the device is implanted. Patients who are not at risk, so the ones who have an ODEP 10A or 10A star rated implant, but are symptomatic, should also be seen annually. With regards to other implants in asymptomatic patients not at risk, not of the category, the three patient categories that were mentioned above, should be seen annually for the first five years, then, ten, then two yearly until year 10, and then three yearly thereafter. So a slightly um, uh, cumbersome to remember all of that, but remember you can divide the patients to those who are at risk category, those who are not at risk, and those who are symptomatic and asymptomatic, and then try and work out your follow-up plan for them accordingly. Regarding uncemented femoral stem implants, the maximum amount of micromotion allowed, 50 micrometer, 150 micrometer, 15, 530 micrometer. So a question directed at the um, basic sciences with regards to uncemented, 
total hip replacement femoral stems? The correct answer is 150 micrometer is the maximum amount allowed for micromotion. As any micromotion more than that will result in no integration uh, with the uh, bone uh, implant interface and therefore a loose implant that will require revision. The other parameters to remember is the optimal pore size on the coated uh, uncemented femoral stems is to be anywhere between 50 to 150 micro, micro uh, meters. Uh, maximum gap between implant and bone is 50. And the micro motion, as we said, is 150. The optimal porosity for the implant should be 40 to 50%. And thickness of the hydroxyapatite is 50 micro meter. That come, draws us to the conclusion of these 10 questions with regards to total hip arthroplasty um, uh, that commonly will be asked on in your exam. And I hope this has been useful for you. Uh, any uh, questions or any uh, highlights from uh, uh, Hitesh is uh, very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Zaid, for that brilliant presentation, as usual. Uh, Zaid, can you just uh, provide us an overview of the ODEP criteria? Actually, it's, I mean, I have almost forgotten. Uh, can you say, sorry, can you repeat that again? The ODEP, ODEP, ODEP yeah. So, yeah, the, uh, the ODEP, obviously, it's, um, um, it is a track record of uh, different implants um, that keeps an eye on terms of performance of each implant and uh, the revision rate for each. And therefore, um, what is recommended is the 10, 10A or 10A star, which essentially means that uh, the implant has track record history of a minimum of 10 years in the market with a, a very, low, very low revision rate, put it as simple as that. And that tends to be kind of the benchmark to aim for, um, for you know, with, with, with regards to offering patients uh, arthroplasty, whether it's a knee arthroplasty or hip arthroplasty or any arthroplasty uh, in, in, in the body, really. Um, now, there, there, are, um, there are implants who are, have not yet reached the 10A rating, uh, and, all, and those are potentially the ones that are being tested as well. And there's a different route and pathway as a surgeon in the UK. When you offer your patients those kind of implants, um, they can be still offered, but often um, and preferably during trials and, um, you know, in a, in a more controlled fashion so that you can always keep your patients um, uh, safe with regards to previous problems that have happened, especially with the resurfacing as patients have underwent operations that then uh, were deemed uh, unsuitable and had to come uh, back for revisions as such. So 10 stands for the years, right? And A is what? Um, a is, the, uh, is your revision uh, rate uh, compared to previous, to other implants uh, in the market. Um, and uh, obviously the star is for the, the implants who are performing at a higher uh, level compared to other implants, even if you are reaching the A uh, level. Thank you, Zaid. Uh, Zaid, uh, for the benefit of the audience, do you think uh, we can uh, just show them the OrthoPass website? Is it on, uh, can you get it on screen? So someone wants to log in, they can just... Yeah, of course, no problem. Um, so... I will just change my uh, screen. So this is our home page, hasn't changed yet. And um, as always, uh, we keep everything on um, the exam with regards to the format dates uh, available uh, for people to know with regards to based in the UK or international. So the next uh, exam internationally is the clinical exam on the 21st of June that's happening in Dubai. Uh, our uh, candidates are in the UK are sitting an exam in April. That's uh, very close by now. Um, and uh, we keep that up to date with obviously links to the calendar from the uh, official uh, website that conducts the exam. And um, as you can see here, uh, I'll just quickly uh, show the interface where you can um, 
the candidates can create the tests uh, and they can track also their record through my performance section. Um, uh, to, 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 oh, actually, this is because the admin, um, the admin username that I'm using, so I actually don't have the my performance on there, uh, but uh, we can certainly show it on a different uh, user. And if I show you my performance here, and that, um, it, as you obviously start taking more tests, you will see how well you're doing uh, amongst uh, the subspecialties. And, you know, for instance, here, you can see that the lowest performing was foot and ankle, and therefore you can always um, target that subspecialty more um, to try and improve your performance. And also you can go back to previous tests that you have taken, and if they're incomplete, you can complete them and you can go and review them again and review the questions that have been taken. Um, and that's and where, mostly. Yeah, where are the, for example, someone wants to do the hip uh, arthroplasty. So how do they go about it? Uh, so here you can choose the hip module. And then obviously, because this is a like a test um, a username, when you have the full, ac uh, the full access, you will have obviously a higher number of questions. And then you can choose whether you take all questions or whether you want the ones that you haven't taken before or the ones that you've answered but answered incorrectly. And uh, for this one, we will just go with what is available, which is everything. And then generally speaking, time for a question is in seconds. And we tend to say, try and aim when you practice to do 65 seconds per question. You then choose whether you want to see the explanation immediately following your answer or whether you want to answer all the questions and not be shown the correct answer and explanation, just like the exam. And you choose which mode and you choose a test name and you create the test and you go through the questions here. For example, in the, low, in the learning mode here, all of the following are recognized non-traumatic risk factor of osteoporosis of femoral uh, head, except I think the correct answer. What do you think the correct answer, Hitesh? <laughs> all of the following are recognized non-traumatic risk except alcoholism factor five, Gaussian smoking. Absolutely. There we go. So that here, in this mode, you can see your answer immediately. And it, it will, this answer can be obviously some, depending on the topic, it can be very detailed, can be short and, and sweet so that you can just get the absolute point of the question and move on to the next one. And therefore here I can show you the direct causes, irradiation, trauma, hematology, et cetera, et cetera. And you move on to your next question and so forth. Um, and when you obviously reach uh, the end, you click review and complete, and that will allow you uh, to go back to any question that you haven't answered or change the answer or look at what you've answered previously. And then you submit your test, which in which case that will give you 25%. Um, and uh, obviously, again, you still have an option to review those even after you check your result and go back through the questions again. Thank you, Zed, for that. And congratulations once again for making this fantastic website, Zed. I know there's a lot of effort put on to make this one. And uh, thank you so much once again. Thank you, Hitesh, for having me again. And uh, excellent. Uh, congratulations for you as well. One million views on YouTube. Uh, that's uh, that's an impre very, very impressive. And, two million. Uh, yeah. Uh, two million. Oh, sorry. That was two million. I, I saw the million and I couldn't remember which one. No, congratulations. Congratulations to you as well. Excellent program. And uh, I'm looking forward to come back again here uh, with, uh, with more uh, questions as well.